Chapter Five of Things Seen in Florence by Elizabeth Grierson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Street and Market. If we really wish to catch the spirit of any foreign town or city, we must cultivate the gentle art of loitering. Otherwise, we will lose a great deal that is quite as much or even more worth seeing than the stereotype sights of the place. In order to gain this insight into Florentine life, we must leave such thoroughfares as the Via Calzaioli or the Via Tornabuoni, which are the Bond Street and the Regent Street of the city, and wander into the network of narrower streets and alleys which lie south of the Duomo, between the Bargello and Santa Croce and in the region known as the Oltrano, which lies across the river. We are fortunate, for instance, if we chance to be living in any of the pensions overlooking the Arno near the Ponte delle Grazie, for this is one of the bridges which forms an easy means of approach to the many barocci, or country carts, which come into the city from the country in the early morning. If we have travelled straight from France or Switzerland, and have had no previous experience of tuscan life the rumble of the first baroccio which chances to pass under our windows on the morning after our arrival in florence is an epoch-making sound for it is our introduction to a certain atmosphere which cannot be described but which unless we are very unimaginative will always rise up in our minds whenever we think of italy to begin with we cannot stay in bed when we hear it for the rumble has accompaniments a tinkle of bells a cracking of a whip and certain strange uncouth cries which sound so mysterious in the dawning light that we are forced to get up and look out into the street then we see passing below us a long curiously shaped cart perilously balanced on two wheels it is drawn by three animals apparently of the equine species but not of the same size and it is piled up with a pyramid of great glass jars half buried in straw beside the equipage walks the driver a slim agile figure with a soft black broad-brimmed hat while from the near shaft hangs a lighted lantern bobbing up and down like a will-o'-the-wisp later in the morning we will have plenty of opportunity to examine a baroccio at close quarters for there will be numbers of them standing around by the Via de Neri and the Loggia del Grano. And it is worth while to do so, for the Baroccio, like the Barca or river boat, is a relic of the past, when all the merchandise of the city had to be conveyed backwards and forwards by road or water. It is always fashioned in exactly the same manner, out of seven kinds of wood, beech for the shafts, cypress for the floor, acacia for the drag, ilex for the spokes of the wheels walnut for the knaves and fellows and so on so that in spite of its somewhat ramshackle appearance the baroccio is rather a valuable adjunct to a farm over the making of which much time and trouble has been spent these carts are very light being composed only of a floor and a framework and it is amazing to see the numbers of flagons of wine or jars of oil which can be piled upon them and brought in safety over miles of rough road with nothing but a little straw between the layers of bottles to prevent vibration under the cart hangs apex downwards a triangular arrangement of strong wooden spars which just clears the ground when the baroccio is in motion but which rests upon it when the horses are unyoked thus forming a third support and so preventing the cart from tipping either backwards or forwards Within this triangle a basket is hung, which forms a convenient receptacle for any sundries the driver desires to carry with him. The lantern hangs here also when it is not in use. The gubbia, or team of animals, which draw the baroccio, is worth studying. Sometimes it is composed of two, sometimes of three quadrupeds. These may be either horses, ponies or mules. Very often, one of each species is represented the only rule is that the biggest animal goes between the shafts the smaller beasts walk meekly on each side fastened only to one shaft if it is winter all three are covered with bright red blankets if it is summer with nets edged with knotted fringes to keep off the flies 
Sometimes, if it is very hot, a cotton sheet is added. The quaint trappings of these animals add to the picturesqueness of the whole turnout, for the essential part of the Tuscan harness is a wooden saddle which all horses carry, and which is finished in front by a high brass-covered horn, studded with nails, and hung with little bells. Besides these adornments, the sides of the saddle, the breast-strap, and the breeching are decorated with bright-coloured tufts of red or blue wool, while the strap between the horse's eyes, and very often the tufted breast-strap, are set with tiny mirrors of silvered glass, of all shapes and sizes. Occasionally, also a fox's tail, or a wild boar's tusk, may hang at the cheek-strap, and a pheasant's feather is fastened between its ears while if we were to make friends with the driver and persuade him to allow us to examine the saddle closely we would be almost certain to find under the trappings that cover it a fierce-looking blue eye painted on the wood outlined by deep gouge marks which are coloured a bright red the discovery of this eye would make us suspect especially if we knew anything of folklore that the contadino has some other motives in view than mere ornamentation when he decks the harness of his mules with tiny looking-glasses, pheasant's feathers, and tufts of wool. And so it is, for Italian peasants have a great fear of the powers of darkness, and a firm belief in witches and the evil eye. Therefore, as they must travel many a lonely mile on country roads, they deck their horses with amulets, with bells and looking-glasses, tufts of wool and foxes' tails, in order to frighten off these unhallowed spirits, and above all they stamp an evil eye, which is always supposed to be blue, on their own belongings, thus rendering them impervious to malign influences from outside. The contadino is very mindful of the comfort of his team, for as we see, every animal, be he horse, mule, or pony, has a deep rope basket full of hay fastened to his headgear, and as this basket hangs down just in front of his nose, he can take a mouthful whenever he halts for a moment. Many of these men, especially those whose barocci are laden with wine or oil, hold the position of fattore or steward on large estates in the country, and they are on their way to the wine or oil merchants with part of the produce from the vineyards or olive yards of which they are in charge. In bygone days, when every Tuscan landowner of any pretensions had his palace or mansion in Florence, the wine and oil from the estate were brought direct to the family house in town. There it was sold retail by the portinaio or porter, generally an old family retainer, through a little window which opened by a sliding panel close to the great door of the courtyard. Nowadays, however, the great nobles and gentry have their town houses, for the most part in Rome and their florentine mansions have passed into other and less aristocratic hands so the fattore is obliged to take the products of his well-tilled land direct to the dealers sometimes the baroccio is drawn by a pair of pure white valdechiana oxen with long straight horns and black noses although they are so big these animals are unequalled for gentleness and docility so much so that their driver guides them not with a rein but with a wave of his hand and they can turn and twist so cleverly that they are used in preference to horses in ploughing among vines and fruit trees the writer will never forget her wonder as when she was going one evening with some friends to the certosa of the valdema which lies about two and a half miles from florence she saw a peasant ploughing his little strip of vineyard which lay on a hillside with one of those huge animals the patch of ground was so little and so steep moreover it was terraced and fig and mulberry trees grew in it as well as vines and as the animal turned and twisted so that the little plough behind could go close to the roots of the trees it seemed as if its weight must bring everything down earth trees and vines in one great avalanche it is interesting to note that these valdechiana oxen are really the old breed of roman cattle the milk-white steers of which we read in history while we have been studying the baroccio and its contents its driver has probably been slaking his thirst at one of the lemonade stalls which are to be found at almost every street corner 
or if it chances to be the season of the cocomero or watermelon he might have brought his team to a standstill beside the stall or barrow where slices of that luscious fruit can be obtained if this is the case we speedily find that a cocomero stall can be quite as picturesque in its way as a barocchio for the colouring of the fruit makes it valuable for decorative purposes even on a street stall and the cocomero vendor seems to have an eye for effect as well as profit for he has cut a number of watermelons into thick round slices which he has hung on the framework of his stall where the rosy red discs set in their circle of cool green rind show up like great peonies as one approaches on the stall itself are wedges of melon each laid on a separate vine leaf which passes with the piece of fruit into the hands of the buyer and can be used as a plate or napkin on a corner of the stall stands a great green earthenware basin full of vine leaves covered with water in order to keep them fresh till they are needed this basin also serves alas as a receptacle for the soldi which the stallholder receives and which when change is required he hands out wet but comparatively clean to the next buyer by and by the watermelons will disappear along with the rest of the autumn fruits and all sorts of nuts will take their place walnuts hazels and chestnuts especially the latter for chestnut trees grow luxuriantly on the hills at the foot of the italian alps and their fruit forms the staple food during the winter not only of the peasants who live under their shade but also of many of the poor in cities as well the chestnut harvest is the most important event of the year to the hill folk and when the first frost of the season has come about the feast of st martin they beat down the nuts with poles and gather them in sacks and baskets the finest they sell to agents who come from distant cities to purchase them for confectionery firms to be turned out later as marron glace and such high-class sweets a large proportion are dried by the peasants over slow fires in huts built for the purpose they are then ground into farina dolce or sweet flour which is either stored for household use or sold then the more enterprising of the mountaineers set off to florence and neighbouring cities with the remainder of the crop there they establish themselves till after christmas sono arrivati i buzzuri the chestnut men have arrived is the common remark in the city and a welcome sight they are to every one be he rich or poor for even to the rich who can roast their buzzuri and eat their castanaccio and necci at home the sight of the glowing charcoal brazier over which the chestnuts are roasted in the streets is a cheerful sight in the dreary wintry days for in november and december even the city of flowers can be chilly and dreary enough while to the poor who can for a few soldi buy at the chestnut stall a good handful of piping hot nuts which they can either carry away with them or eat while they linger round the glowing brazier the comfort and value of this humble fare is untold nor is it by the roasted nuts alone that the butsuri cater to the wants of the populace in the little shops which they have taken and which serve so to speak as their headquarters their wives or sisters are busy from morning to night cooking the chestnuts in various ways and baking delicious and wholesome cakes with chestnut flour here we can buy not only roasted nuts but bolite or boiled as well these are lifted out of huge copper cauldrons where they have been cooked with fennel to improve their flavour a favourite preparation is chestnut flour boiled like porridge until it is so thick that it can be turned out a stiff chocolate-coloured mass onto a wooden board where when it is wanted it is cut in slices with a string and either eaten hot on the spot or carried home to be fried the most common varieties of cakes are castanaccio which is made by filling a shallow copper tray with dough over which is sprinkled aromatic pinoli or kernels of the cone of the stone pine the tray is then placed in the oven and as the copper retains its heat for a considerable time the castanacci when they are baked are often carried in their tins out into the streets especially on to the bridges over the arno where they are sold in slices to the passers-by necci are smaller cakes which in the country at least are baked between flat stones 
which have previously been heated in the fire. When we are visiting the shops of the Butsuri, we are certain to come across those of another very interesting class of men, the charcoal vendors. We generally find them in cavernous cellars, into which we peep with a certain amount of hesitation. The interiors are so dark, and the proprietors so begrimed and fierce-looking, yet here we touch a very important branch of industry, for were it not for the charcoal burners of the Apennines, whose fires we see far up over our heads, if we chance to travel by night by the base of these mountains, and their agents who sell their produce in the city, the Florentine housewife would be in a very awkward predicament indeed. For as all coal that is sold in Italy is imported, charcoal is used for all cooking purposes, and in a great measure as the principal means of heating as well. Oak is the wood that is most commonly used in the production of charcoal. When the trees are felled, the branches and trunks are cut into lengths, and bound closely together in heaps of regular size, in such a manner that a square cavity is left in the centre. This cavity is filled with carefully prepared firewood, which will ignite easily. The heaps of wood are then covered over with brushwood, earth and turf, so as to exclude all air but before the last turf is laid on and the whole pile as far as may be hermetically sealed a burning stick is dropped into the firewood in the centre so as to set it alight when this has been done and the aperture closed the fire which owing to the lack of air burns very slowly is allowed to do its work undisturbed for several days at the end of which the earth and turf are removed and if things have gone rightly a heap of blackened charcoal is found which is ready to be sent down the mountainside for use in the cities. Things do not always go as smoothly as this, however, for if the pile happens to be badly built, or the covering thinly laid on, the wood may burst into actual flames instead of smouldering, in which case the entire heap is spoilt. Ordinary firewood, sawn into logs, is sent down from the mountains also, especially from the forest of Vallombrosa, and sold to burn in open fireplaces another useful article of fuel which can be purchased in those dark recesses are small round cakes known as forme which are made of the refuse from tanneries and serve the same purpose in florence as briquettes do at home large fir cones are also sold for fire lighters and form a very ornamental form of firewood but to return after this digression to the street stalls when the Butsuri have sold all their store of chestnuts, and the brightening sun and lengthening days make charcoal braziers seem a little out of place, our eyes are refreshed by brilliant patches of orange and lemon showing here and there, and we find stalls piled with these fruits, while branches of their glossy foliage are twisted round the framework, changing the bare boards into regular bowers of green. When the first touch of spring is felt in the air, the flower stalls and the flower girls with their baskets appear everywhere in the market place at the entrance to churches on the steps of lodges in the doorways of hotels their stock in trade varies with the seasons first come snowdrops and primroses then jasmine and primula cassia and flaming tulips at easter tide we find countless varieties of lilies lilac violets and hyacinths in early summer and in early autumn as well gardenias roses irises verbena heliotrope dahlias carnations then later chrysanthemums marguerites and geraniums which go on blooming till christmas on the fruit stalls cherries and nesboli a japanese plum replace oranges in april and may to be followed by apricots figs medlars cactus fruit pears and peaches and so the year comes round again to the time of the cocomero and of the luscious grape which however is as little thought of as gooseberries are at home but to see the flowers at their best we must go on a thursday morning to the mercato nuovo which is close to the piazza signoria and can be reached by the via porta rosa this market which was built by bernardo tasso for cosimo i about the year fifteen forty seven used in olden days to be the principal mart for gold and silk, two of the valuable commodities for which Florence was so famous. 
Today it is celebrated for the Tuscan and Leghorn straw hats which the peasants bring from their country workshops and sell under its open roof, for the masses of flowers and flowering shrubs which on certain days of the week are piled against the grey pillars of its loggia, and above all for its bronze boar, that porcellino or little pig, on whose back the little boy in Hans Andersen's fairy tale had such a wonderful ride through the gallery of the Uffizi and into the church of San Croce. The pig, which is found at one side of the building, is represented as raising itself on its front legs, and out of its mouth flows perpetually a stream of cold fresh water. The bristly animal, which was cast by Pietro Tacco, and is a copy of an original marble now in the Uffizi, is beloved by the people of Florence, especially the children, for they have nothing to do when they are thirsty but to clasp him round the snout, and bending back their curly heads, quench their thirst at the cooling stream. It is worth while buying in this market one of the delightfully flexible leghorn hats, which can be obtained here at small cost, but for which so much has to be paid at home. These hats roll up like a roll of calico, and can be packed with the utmost ease, and at the end of a long journey will come out as fresh and tidy as ever. Straw plaiting is, as we shall see when we visit Fiesole or Signa, quite an industry among the women and girls who live in the villages on the outskirts of Florence. The straw is grown on Tuscan soil, and when it has been properly prepared and cut into lengths, is sold in bundles to country women who, with the aid of their daughters, plait it into narrow plaits and sell it by measurement to a merchant, who either turns out the hats in his own little factory or resells the plaited straw to milliners in the city. Very often, as we are wandering round this market, we come on a scrivano or public letter writer who has established himself in some quiet corner ready to indite epistles for simple men and women, country folk most of them, who have not mastered the art of writing for themselves. One of the greatest charms of Florence is the way in which we can watch arts and crafts of all kinds being carried on if we know where to find the craftsman. I suppose no one visits the city without bringing home some souvenir in the shape of leatherwork, embroidery or jewellery, especially ornaments set in turquoises or in the curious green-tinted stone known as the matrix of the turquoise, which are a speciality of Florence. The shops in the larger streets as well as on the Ponte Vecchio and along the Lungarno, are filled with these articles, and very beautiful they are. But they acquire a new value after we have crossed the Ponte Vecchio, and turning to the left have wandered along the Borgo San Jacobo, and have entered the workshops there, and seen the master craftsman and his journeymen and apprentices hard at work, in much the same way as the craftsmen of the Middle Ages worked, in whose botteggi the geniuses of the italian renaissance learned the rudiments of their art such workshops can as we know also be seen on the ponte vecchio and doubtless in other parts of the city as well but it was in the borgo san jacopo just after one turns round from the old bridge that the writer saw them to best advantage as one walks along the street one only sees the tiny little front shops with their open doors and windows crowded with articles fashioned of delicately tooled leather, or emblazoned vellum, or with jewellery, or richly chased gold and silver vessels, most of which are intended for the service of the church. But if we enter one of these shops, we find that another door at the back leads us into a large airy workroom, well supplied with windows, which overlooks the river. Here the actual work is being carried on by neat-handed craftsmen, clad in linen overalls. We watch with breathless interest a jewel being set, or a chalice or arms dish chased and embellished, or some quaint design traced in glowing colours on the vellum page of some illuminated missal. And these are not the only people who are to be seen at work in the Borgo San Jacopo. There are other and humbler occupations which are carried on almost in the open street, for a great many of the little shops which we find farther on have no doors at all during the day at least, and their owners carry on their business in what looks like a series of open sheds. Here we find a cobbler sitting on his stool on the pavement in front of his tiny bottega, cobbling away as fast as he can, and exchanging confidences with his next-door neighbour 
who is a carpenter. The bench of the latter stands across what, presumably, is his doorway, and the curling shavings fall into the street, and are gathered up with great glee by a couple of curly-headed urchins. Next we pass a blacksmith, standing by his anvil, while in the dark recesses of his tiny smithy a heap of charcoal embers are dimly smouldering, Across the street we find a bottega di fornaio, or bake-shop, and here we may see curious circular cakes being put into an enormous oven by the help of a long spade. Close by the bake-shop a woman is engaged in cooking fritters. Next door but one we find a coppersmith beating a huge copper vessel into the shape that he requires. Presently a tall figure appears in the middle of the street, with a large vessel shaped like a very fat water-bottle hanging from his waist by a strap. Pesci d'Arno, he cries as he walks along. It is one of the Renaioli from the Arno, selling his catch of fish, and if we know enough Italian to be able to enter into conversation with him, he will tell us that the strangely shaped vessel is in reality only a zucca or gourd, which he himself has grown in his cottage garden and moulded into its present form by resting it on a board when it was growing in order to make it flat at the bottom, and tying a tight bandage round it near the top, in order to constrict it at the neck. Then, after it had attained the proper shape and dimensions, and had been cut from its stem and ripened and hardened by being left lying in the sun for a time, he made it watertight, by cutting off the top and pouring a little boiling pitch into it, and turning it round and round in his hands, until the whole of the inside was coated by the pitch, which formed a kind of watertight glaze. The zucca is an exceedingly useful vegetable, as it will grow in any corner of waste ground, so it is cultivated largely by the country folk, who not only find a ready market for it in its natural state, but who make great numbers of vessels like that which we have seen the Renaioli carrying, and sell them in the poorer parts of the city, where people buy them instead of crockery filling them with rice, beans, macaroni, salt, etc., and hanging them from the rafters in their kitchens. We do not find much of the beautiful Florentine embroidery and handmade lace in the Borgo de Jacopo. To obtain that, we must once more cross the Arno and go to the little shops which we find under the stone arches at the base of the great mansions that look out on the Lungarno or to those more pretentious sales-rooms in such streets as the Via Tornabuoni or the Via Calzaioli. The embroidery is only sold in these shops, however. It is executed by women and girls in their own homes, and as we pass along some side street, we often see a group of them sitting on the doorsteps, or on stools on the pavement, chatting and laughing together, as their busy needles fly in and out. Most of these women have been taught their craft by nuns under the auspices of a society known as the Industria Feminile, or Women's Industries, which society is well worthy of support, for in view of the fact that a great number of the slum children in Italy begin life as professional beggars, and are apt to continue in the same vocation when they are grown up, this society endeavours to get hold of young girls and give them a thorough training in all sorts of fine needlework and embroidery, so that they have a trade at their finger-ends, by which they can earn their own living, or at least help to do so. The Industria Femenile is an association, entirely undenominational, formed of ladies, Italians and foreigners, for the encouragement of home industries. A branch of this association is to be found in most Italian cities. It undertakes the sale of the work produced, without the intervention of the middleman. Ladies in country districts organise and instruct in the revival of local forms of home work, such as weaving, embroidery, lace, basket work, etc. Two special exhibitions of work so produced are held in Florence, one before Christmas and one at Easter. End of chapter 5「『Things Seen in Florence』by Elizabeth Grierson」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 by Hearth and Home Very few people in Florence live in a self-contained house. 
the custom is rather to rent a flat or to live in one of the flats of one's own house and to let the others to strangers or to junior branches of one's own family this is because the houses are so spacious that it would be impossible except a perfect retinue of servants were kept to inhabit the whole of one of them moreover the way in which they are built makes some system of subdivision almost necessary for even the old palaces of which there are so many seem to have been planned with a view to accommodating not only the head of the family and his children but his son's families as well and the more modern buildings have used the same method we always find a broad roomy staircase often of marble which ascends from the ground floor to the top of the house on each landing two doors one to right one to left give access to the suite of rooms situated on that landing this makes it an easy matter to divide the house into quartiere or flats each of which can be inhabited by one family while the staircase is common property and so are the services of the portinaio who lives in a little room on the ground floor and is supposed to sweep the stairs take in letters and parcels as well as any messages which may be left for those who live in the household of which he is the official caretaker as a great deal of the comfort of life depends on how one stands in the favour of the portinaio it is as well to keep on good terms with him otherwise he can cause endless annoyance by mislaying letters and parcels forgetting important messages and so on of course we do not find porters in every house that depends upon the circumstances of the tenants although in florence more than in most cities rich and poor are thrown together in a very wholesome manner for the price of quartiere and rooms vary according to their height from the ground and it often happens that some very rich and aristocratic family may be living on the first floor while the fourth or fifth may be inhabited by very poor but decent artisans when no porter is kept various means are employed by dwellers on the upper flats to avoid the constant labour of going up and down the many long flights of stairs the street door is opened by means of a strong wire while when message boys arrive or the postman goes his rounds a basket is let down to the street from a window and drawn up again when the parcel or letter has been placed in it as regards rents apartments as flats are generally called are much cheaper on the south side of the arno than on the north while as to the superiority of one locality over another no fixed rule can be laid down as one often finds charming apartments with lovely views and quaint lodges and roof gardens in very narrow streets where the ground floor is occupied by tiny pokey shops as most of the houses have thick walls and floors of terrazzo or varnished brick in very luxurious dwellings the floors are of parquet they are as a rule delightfully cool in summer although somewhat dark when the sun shutters are closed but they are terribly cold in winter unless carpets are laid down and provision made in the sitting-rooms for open fires for florence has by no means an ideal winter climate indeed in december january and february when the bitter wind known as the tramontana sweeps down from the snow-covered apennines and sears the valley of the arno with its keen icy breath it is often intensely cold and there is little comfort to be had in the large bare rooms of an ordinary italian house heated only by a scaldino standing forlornly in the middle of the floor true every person in the house and for that matter every person in the street as well have their own private scaldino which they carry in their hands or use as a foot warmer but even so these funny little earthenware pots filled with glowing charcoal embers do not make up for a blazing fire or even for a well-ventilated stove as for hot water bottles they are not used but a good substitute is to be found in the trabicolo which is a framework of lathes shaped like a dish cover and containing a clay pot full of hot ashes which we may find rising like a hunch under our bedclothes in the middle of our bed when we retire to rest of course it has to be removed but it leaves a comfortable heat behind it as elsewhere on the continent it is usual in a florentine household to have early breakfast consisting of coffee rolls and butter served in one's own room 
the public meals being luncheon or early dinner at midday and another repast which may vary between supper and a stereotyped late dinner at seven in upper-class houses afternoon tea is now a recognised institution here is a fair specimen of the menu which we may have or would have had before the war at dinner in an ordinary italian middle-class house soup omelette or dish of macaroni cooked with tomatoes or other vegetables some variety of meat cooked in oil or boiled with rice or vegetables chicken in some form or other with salad or when odds and ends needed to be used up by the thrifty housewife a fritto misto or mixed fry into which everything is put scraps of meat cold vegetables rice squares of bread celery cut into dice scraps of liver and so on in this heterogeneous dish these are all fried brown and taste so deliciously that no one is inclined to ask what one is eating puddings are more common in italy than in france and chianti the ordinary red wine of the country and fruit find a place at every meal mutton is inferior rabbits are only eaten by the very lowest classes but veal is excellent and lamb can be had all the year round beef kid pork and above all poultry are staple articles of food butter is a luxury oil taking its place as far as possible and sweets and jam are rare owing to the high price of sugar on the other hand fresh fruit is cheap and most abundant in establishments where a cook is kept she generally does the marketing as much chaffering and bargaining is needed if one would obtain commodities at fair prices and mistresses as a rule prefer to avoid this disagreeable part of housekeeping but shopping by proxy has its disadvantages and if any one intends to make a lengthened stay in florence it is better to acquire a sufficient knowledge of italian to make oneself understood and boldly tackle both the stallholders in the market and the shopkeepers for oneself catering for small households is much easier in florence than it is at home for things are sold in such a way that much more variety in food can be obtained there is no need for any one to buy a whole fowl for instance if they do not wish to do so all that is necessary is to purchase just that part of the bird that is required if a fricassee is wanted or an entree or a delicate repast for an invalid one or both of the breast portions can be bought if an ordinary stew is needed the legs and neck are sold for the purpose at a very cheap rate the wings can be included if necessary for soup there is the carcass while the combs wattles and liver are sold by themselves under the name of regalia going as a rule to the kitchens of the rich to be used in the preparation of sauces and entrees the principal market for food supplies is that of san ambrogio which is held in the piazza ghiberti near the porte alla croce this market which is commonly called the mercato dell'erbi is a very pretty sight as it is here that all fruit and vegetables wholesale as well as retail are sold along with seeds young plants and trees and all agricultural and horticultural appliances but one must rise betimes to see it at its best for in spring and summer the contadini begin to arrive from the country about four a m their barocci laden with farm and garden produce and an hour later the market is in full swing fruit can be purchased very cheaply here one of the most interesting sights of the market is the hundreds of horses and mules which still harnessed to their barocci are left standing for hours quite alone while their owners are busy attending to their stalls in another part of the square wandering about these stalls one can study many of the plainly fashioned homely appliances used by the tuscan peasants in their work in field or garden here we see a pile of sickles exactly similar in shape to those with which the etruscan husbandman shore down his hay or corn there is a heap of the roughly hewn wooden utensils tubs pails etc which will be needed at the time of the rendemiare farther on a white-haired countryman is watching over a stack of ladders such as are used when men prune the olive trees or carefully gather the ripened fruit in the autumn in winter beside the markets there are open batola or cook shops where food may be bought ready cooked 
even if you have no wish to become a customer it is very fascinating to linger for a time in front of one of these and watch the proceedings which are carried on inside away in the background are glowing charcoal furnaces covered in like ovens on top of which stand numberless copper pots and pans out of which most toothsome odours emanate at one side is an open fire overhung by a great wheel which turns a spit on which are impaled not only ducks and fowls but thrushes and larks as well in front on a heated counter lie piles of eatables of all sorts from slices of yellow polenta made of maize and oil and different kinds of chestnut cakes to multitudinous fritters made of all sorts of ingredients from veal sweetbreads and calves brains to the blossoms of vegetable marrows and frogs legs to breakfast in one's bedroom where one can partake of the meal in dressing gown and bedroom slippers is not conducive to trigness of attire and to our notions the mistress of a florentine house might not represent an ideal picture of tidiness were we to call on her in the early hours of the morning but when she goes out to mass or later in the day to walk in the boboli gardens or drive in the cascine all is changed the boboli gardens which run up the hill from the pitti palace are very beautiful and are also interesting from a botanical point of view for being laid out in the quarries from which the stone was taken to build the pitti palace and other structures they are naturally very sheltered and all sorts of rare and tropical plants grow luxuriantly in them in fact they are more or less show gardens where one walks primly about and admires the plants or sits gratefully in the shade on hot afternoons but the cascine or great public park which stretches for some miles westward along the arno from the piazza degli zuavi is a more homely place of recreation and is a joy and boon to every inhabitant of florence rich and poor alike covering a large extent of ground once a desolate range of mud-banks which were reclaimed and cultivated by the notorious alessandro de medici who in spite of his vicious tastes had a great love for horticulture it now resembles a stretch of forest land most of it being covered with tall shady trees intersected by narrow winding paths while here and there we suddenly come out into delightfully green meadows where cows are browsing and where any one can picnic if they will there are also two broad carriage drives one of which runs through the woods and is the fashionable rendezvous of florentine society in summer while in winter the sunny sheltered drive by the banks of the arno is the more popular every one who can afford to do so drives in the cascine on sundays even if they go on foot all the other days of the week indeed in bygone times it was customary to have a clause inserted in most marriage contracts to the effect that the husband bound himself to provide a carriage at more or less frequent intervals in which his wife might drive in the cascine fashionable young mothers are very frequently to be seen in this park driving in motors or carriages accompanied by their babies who are carried on cushions by their balia or wet nurse these balias are most imposing personages for they are women chosen for their strength and fine physique who come from the country or from the mountains to take charge of the city baby for the first year of its existence they wear a special dress which is extremely picturesque and adds to the distinction of their appearance it consists of a brightly coloured stuff gown an embroidered apron and fichu trimmed with lace and a headdress composed of an enormous bow or ruche of broad ribbon pink for a girl blue or scarlet for a boy with long ends which hang down to the hem of their skirts behind there is a miniature race course in the cascine where race meetings are held from easter monday until the heat grows too oppressive for the sport in spring and autumn a game called pallone which is a mixture of fives and tennis and yet unlike both is played here on large courts by young men in the evening just as tennis is played at home the game is played with a leather ball about half the size of a football 
and instead of rackets each of the six players has a curious pear-shaped contrivance strapped on his right forearm with this he strikes the ball there are three players on each side with a line not a net dividing them from their opponents and the scoring is by points a great deal of mild betting on the game goes on among the spectators who watch it with deep interest End of chapter 6「Seven of Things Seen in Florence」by Elizabeth Grierson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Fasts and Festivals Nearly seven hundred years have gone by since the little poor man of Assisi taught the humble peasant folk of Greccio the truths of the Nativity by turning the corner of the village church into a stable and presenting before their eyes a realistic representation of the events that took place in bethlehem on the first christmas eve it was a happy inspiration which has borne fruit among the simple latin races who happily for themselves have not that pride of intellect which refuses to be taught like little children by pictures for no one can go as we must certainly go if we are in florence on christmas eve into some of the dimly lit churches and watch the groups of people fathers and mothers and little children stealing forward to gaze with tender reverent eyes at the presepio or crib which has been erected in a corner near the altar or in a chapel without feeling that to them at least the representation grotesque though it may sometimes be of the crib and the holy child watched over by saint mary and saint joseph and adored by the shepherds while ox and ass look on is a fitting preparation for the great festival of the incarnation on christmas day every one who can afford to do so is expected to give a ceppo literally a log to every waiter chambermaid servant or tradesman with whom they have come into close contact of course the expression is synonymous with the english christmas box of boxing day the word is interesting as it refers to the great yule log which from the earliest pagan times up to a century or two ago the head of the house was wont to place on the lari or fire dogs on christmas eve and after having sprinkled it with some wine from the family cup set on fire in the hope that it would smoulder during the intervening twelve days till the epiphany epiphany is the children's festival when befana visits them in the same way as santa claus visits the children of other lands on christmas eve but befana is not nearly such a lovable person as good saint nicholas she is an old woman who is supposed to live in the chimney all the year round except on the eve of the festival of the three kings when she descends from her black hiding-place and visits the bedsides of the children when they are fast asleep if they have been good during the year she fills their stockings with toys if naughty they are rewarded with a mere handful of toys and a tiny birch broom it naturally follows that befana is dreaded rather than loved in florentine nurseries for the children are threatened with her displeasure whenever they are disobedient or troublesome and as it is supposed the noise of trumpets and bells will frighten her away the children go to the numerous street stalls which are erected everywhere between christmas and epiphany and spend their soldi on the whistles horns and tiny clay bells which are to be found there and return home happy feeling that they can bid defiance to the black-faced bogey while their parents haunt the same stalls in search of cheap toys with which to fill the little stockings on saint antonio's day january seventeen the cabmen send little flat loaves of bread pane de san antonio to their patrons and patronesses and some of them take their horses to church to be blessed from christmas to shrove tuesday is a time of festivity when rich and poor alike indulge in gaieties of various kinds but when lent begins all entertainments stop and the only recreation for the next six weeks is on sundays at the nut fairs these fairs are quite a feature of the penitential season and in bygone years were inaugurated by a fair held early on ash wednesday morning 
under the loggia of san paulino in the piazza santa maria novella at which all kinds of dried fruits and cereals were sold the idea being that on that morning thrifty housewives were eager to lay in a stock of figs olives raisins etc to vary the lenten fare but this fair has been discontinued and such purchases must be made in ordinary shops or at the nut fairs which are held on sundays at different gates of the city these nut fairs form a great meeting place for the members of the artisan classes and the peasants from the surrounding districts so much so that they are regarded as affording the most favourable opportunities which the lads and lasses have of commencing their courtships and bringing them to a happy conclusion the first three fairs which are known respectively as the fiera dei curiosi the fair of the curious the fiera dei furiosi the fair of the furious and the fiera dei innamorati the fair of the lovers are held in the piazza san gallo just beside the ancient gateway of that name the fourth fair which falls on mid lent sunday has no special appellation and is held at the porta del prato the fifth fair the fiera dei contratti takes place at the porta romana and is the most important of all as any marriages which have been arranged are announced there the marriage contract settled and congratulations received the sixth fair is known as the fair of the rejected the idea being perhaps that those who have not had the good fortune to appear under the guise of betrothed persons on the previous sunday may at this last festal gathering have another chance it is held at the porto san frediano at all these fairs nuts and almonds are the principal commodities offered for sale on the gaily draped stalls but other things are sold as well dried fruits and little cakes which owing to the lenten season are baked entirely without butter chief among those are maritozzi or roman buns cheap brown biscuits called quaresimali and another variety of biscuits berigidisi which are strongly flavoured with aniseed and which are baked on the spot in little portable ovens in mid lent comes the day of scala when children with clever fingers cut little ladders out of cardboard or soft perforated paper then run out into the streets to play pranks on unwary passers-by they carefully whiten one side of a cardboard ladder with chalk then stamp its impress on the black coat of some respectable citizen and pin a fluttering paper ladder to a lady's skirt then they dart off with the mocking cry la la you've got it you've got it only to repeat the trick at the corner of the next street from the point of view of ecclesiastical customs holy week and easter are the most interesting of all the year to spend in florence a great many of these customs prevail in other parts of italy as they are the ordinary ceremonies connected with the ritual of the roman church but one the scopio del caro which takes place on easter even is unique being purely local and people from all parts of the world try if they are anywhere in the neighbourhood to be in florence on that day in order to witness it preparations for the easter festival begin in passion week or even in the week preceding it for if at that time we are visiting any house in the city large or small rich or poor we would be liable to stumble on a spring cleaning the reason for this being not so much the season of the year as the fact that in passion week every parish priest visits not only every house in his parish but every room in that house blessing it and sprinkling it with holy water this is known as the blessing of the houses and naturally every housewife wishes to have her domestic domain in apple pie order for the occasion towards the end of passion week we see numbers of barocci entering the town laden not with their usual load of wine and flagons but with branches of silvery olives these together with quantities of palms are taken into the duomo or the church of the santissima annunziata in the piazza of that name and piled up in front of the altar on palm sunday morning before mass they are blessed by the celebrating priest and distributed to the other clergy and to the members of the congregation when this part of the service is over 
an imposing procession takes place all the clergy with olive branches in their hands rise from their seats in the choir and move slowly down the church while the accounts of our lord's entry into jerusalem from the various gospels are sung by the choir the procession does not halt at the west door but proceeds straight out of church into the porch and the door is closed behind it then the choir sing the palm sunday hymn all glory lord and honour while the clergy reply with the refrain outside when the hymn is finished the doors are once more opened and the gorgeously vested priests move slowly back to their places of course there are a great many more palms and olives blessed than are distributed in church and those that are over are sold on the steps for every one likes to have an olive benedetto stuck up in his house or barn or stable to protect it from evil influences throughout the coming year another and more mundane preparation is to be found in the fiera di cavalli e bovini or cattle show which is held in the markets outside the barrier of san jacopo on the wednesday in holy week when cattle which have been fattened for the easter feast just as they are fattened for christmas in england are exposed for sale on the afternoon of that day the first of the solemn services of the passion is held this is the matutino delle tenebre and it consists of the matins and lords proper to maundy thursday which are said on the previous day and are spoken of as the matins of darkness because of the tradition that the early christians were in the habit of holding offices of prayer in the catacombs at dead of night this service lasts for three hours and is most impressive during the singing of the benedictus the altar lights are extinguished one by one until only one which represents christ remains and that is removed from the altar and hidden behind it in order to typify our lord's death and burial when in this way the church has been rendered utterly dark and gloomy the clergy and congregation beat the floor with slender rods of willow which can be bought outside thus producing the noise known as the strepitacula which is supposed to represent the upheaval of natural forces at the final hour of the crucifixion afterwards the one tiny light is restored to the altar and the worshippers disperse in reverent silence during mass on holy thursday all the bells of the churches ring out in a sudden burst of sound then all is quiet and no bell is heard again in the city until two days later when they commence to ring at midday on easter even during the celebration of the maundy thursday mass in the cathedral the ceremony takes place of the blessing of the holy oils the three oils the oil of the sick used in extreme unction the oil of catechumens used in baptism confirmation and ordination and the oil of chrism which is a mixture of oil and balsam and is used in the consecration of bishops and in other ceremonies are placed in front of the archbishop in three ampoule or jars that dignitary assisted by twelve priests and seven deacons representing the twelve apostles and seven deacons of the early church reads prayers of exorcism and blessing over the oils which are then set apart for sacred purposes in the afternoon the whole city is astir for as has been the custom in italy from medieval times the sepulturi or sepulchres are formed in the principal churches on maunday thursday and all good catholics consider it a duty to visit seven of them to make the visita delle chiese as it is called each sepulchre represents a flower-decked tomb in a garden in the middle of which the host is placed surrounded by lights and the emblems of the passion a certain kind of silvery grass known as vecchia is largely used in the decoration of these gardens and as we look at its strange white colour we wonder what species of plant it is and where it comes from the fact is that it is grown for the purpose in dark vaults or cellars where no light can enter and in this way it acquires this strangely bleached hue in some churches we also find the figure of the dead christ exposed so that the faithful may pray and meditate beside it and it is a pretty sight to see the little children some of them so young that they can hardly toddle coming with their mothers or elder brothers and sisters to kiss the wounds and then kneel down and say their baby prayers 
Another interesting ceremony goes on in several of the churches on this busy afternoon. This is the lavanda, or washing of the feet, in commemoration of that first feet washing which took place in the upper room at Jerusalem. If we would see the ceremony at its best, we will take up our places in the Duomo in good time, for the service begins at half-past three, and, as it is conducted within the marble choir, every spot in the church where anything can be seen is very quickly occupied. It is desirable to secure a position on the south side of the altar, if possible, as the proceedings can be seen best from that side of the choir. As it is somewhat difficult to see into the choir at all, most of the onlookers stand on chairs, which can be rented for a few soldi, and even from this coin of vantage we may count ourselves fortunate if we catch a glimpse of the thirteen old men, each one of whom represents an apostle, including St. Matthias, who are sitting in state on a platform, clothed in loose white gowns, and glorying in the brand new boots and socks which they have just donned in the archbishop's palace which adjoins the cathedral presently the archbishop walks in gorgeous in cope and mitre and attended by a group of clergy he seats himself in his episcopal chair under its canopy of purple while a sermon is preached during which the onlookers get down from their perches and rest when the oration is finished the rush of movement is once more heard for every one jumps upon his chair again each of the old men uncovers a foot then the archbishop and his assistants move slowly across the platform one priest carries a silver basin another a ewer and a third a napkin each foot is in turn held over the basin the archiepiscopal fingers sprinkle it with water from the ewer the third priest dries it with the napkin, and so the ceremony wears to a close. Besides the new boots and socks, each of the old men receives a loaf of bread and a piece of money, so we can well imagine that they go home quite satisfied with the parts they have been called on to play. The services on Good Friday morning are entirely devotional, but in the afternoon we can, if we will, see the miraculous crucifix of San Gualberto, uncovered at Santa Trinita. To this crucifix an interesting story is attached. It is said that on the evening of Good Friday, A.D. 1003, Giovanni Gualberto, second son of the Lord of Petraia, was riding up the hill of San Miniato with an aching and passionate heart, which was burning to avenge the death of his elder brother, whom he dearly loved, and who had recently been murdered. On the way he met the perpetrator of the foul deed, and would fain have killed him. But the wretched man fell on his knees and begged for mercy in the name of him who on that day died for his enemies. The young Count, being a Christian man, could not refuse the plea, and passed on, leaving him unhurt. But feeling rather restless and unhappy, he entered the church of San Miniato, where the crucifix of which we speak hung. He knelt before it in prayer, and lo, to his awe and astonishment, the figure bowed its head towards him in approval. Gualberta was so impressed by what he took to be a direct message from God that he left the world, and eventually founded the order of the reformed Benedictines on the height of Vallombrosa. The miraculous crucifix remained in the church of San Miniato for six hundred years. Then, in A.D. 1671, it was removed to Santa Trinita, where it hangs concealed in the chapel of San Paolo, except on Good Friday afternoons, and other rare occasions when it is exposed to the gaze of the faithful. If one has enough energy left after viewing the various religious ceremonies of the day in Florence, it is worth while in the evening to take a tram from the Piazza del Duomo and go out to the little village of Grassina, which lies in a country valley about six mile distant. For it is here that the famous procession of Gesù Morto, or the Dead Redeemer, is held year by year, as Good Friday comes round. When we reach the village, we by no means find ourselves in an atmosphere of peace, for a fair has been held in the afternoon, and the tiny piazza is still crowded with stalls, while vehicles of all kinds keep pouring in from Florence and the surrounding districts. 
but upon the hillsides all is quiet and as the clock strikes seven a picturesque and yet in a way solemn procession leaves a little church standing high up among the vineyards and lit on its way by torches winds down the slope towards where we stand first come roman soldiers on horseback wearing imitation armour and long cloaks then come baby angels and slim young girls dressed in white carrying lighted tapers following them walk a company of married women clad in deepest mourning and veiled in black then appears a statue of the mater dolorosa borne on the shoulders of sturdy contadini behind it walk the parish priests accompanied by various guilds of men and the village choir chanting the miserere in mournful strains a huge black canopy next appears in view borne unsteadily by a dozen countrymen as it passes every head is uncovered every knee bent for under it on a bier carried shoulder high is the figure of the dead christ with its pallid face and gaping wounds other companies of men mourning matrons and singing boys follow and last of all the village band brings up the rear all those who take part in this procession are simple peasant folk and the details of it may seem crude and even tawdry to the critical outsider but with the easter moon shining down on us and the soft grey shimmer of olive leaves surrounding us on every side a certain atmosphere is created which makes it easier to throw one's thoughts back to a tomb in the garden of joseph of arimathea where never man had yet lain one needs must be early astir on easter even if one would witness the most interesting festa of the whole year that of the scopio del caro this ceremony is closely connected with the usual blessing of the new fire which takes place in all roman catholic churches on that day as we saw all the lights were extinguished on wednesday during the matutino delle tenebre and they are relit on easter even in florence the light is obtained from a spark struck on a very precious flint stone in the ancient church of the santissimi apostoli this flint stone or rather stones for there are three has a very curious history it was brought with its companions from the holy sepulchre by a member of the paizzi family in the time of the third crusade and ever since the easter fire has been lit by it when the tinder among which the spark falls has kindled a candle is lit at the flame and placed in a portafuoco or lantern which is carried in procession at the end of a long pole to the duomo accompanied by municipal guards flag-bearers and officers of the commune clad in a quaint costume of red and white hose and jerkins this procession passes through the streets shortly after eight a m and is often interrupted as one after another begs permission to light candles to be burned at their own private shrines from that in the portafuoco at last it reaches the duomo where it is met by the clergy of the cathedral then the great pascal candle which stands on the gospel side of the altar is lit from the flame as well as the other lights soon afterwards an enormous four-storied car known as the carroccio drawn by a quartet of magnificent white oxen with gilded horns and hoofs and splendid trappings of scarlet appears in the piazza and takes up its position in front of the duomo this car is literally bristling with fireworks the oxen are unyoked and led away and soon the pompieri or firemen who are in charge are busy fixing a wire between the carroccio and a stand which is erected near the altar of the great church the western doors of which are thrown wide open meanwhile the piazza is thronged with people many of whom have come from the adjoining villages and wait eagerly for the omen which is to tell them what kind of harvest they may look forward to at half past eleven the archbishop celebrates mass and as twelve o'clock strikes the gloria in excelsis is chanted by the choir instantly all the bells of the city ring out and as if frightened by the clamour an artificial colombina or dove flies along the wire and touches the car then returns to its refuge in the cathedral at its touch the fireworks explode for it carries a lighted fuse in its bosom the fireworks are superb and the noise is deafening 
but to the country folk at least the principal thing to be observed is how the colombina conducts herself if her flight is straight the year's harvest will be an ample one if she wobbles the prospects are poor if easter morning in florence is fine nothing can be more beautiful everything speaks of joy and gladness the tender green of the trees and the delicate tints of the spring flowers which meet us at every corner the merry chiming of the church bells and the triumphant pealing of the organs which ring out through the open doors of the churches the joyous laughter of little children heard over garden walls as they search in the bushes for easter eggs fishes and chickens which they know they will find there while in the general gladness the dome of the cathedral seems to be rosier than usual and its walls whiter and giotto's tower seems to greet us with a blessing of peace as it meets us like the angel of the resurrection waiting to announce the risen lord on ascension day a very popular festa is held in the cascine this is the giorno dei grilli or day of the crickets as a rule the weather is delightful and every one gets up very early and goes out into the park where the primary business is to catch one of the grilli or black field crickets that hop about among the long grass this feat having been accomplished and the little creature enclosed in one of the tiny cages formed of buckwheat straw which are sold in hundreds on the spot the rest of the forenoon is wild pleasantly away in the green park-like spaces or under the shade of the trees then comes merenda or luncheon which is taken al fresco either at one of the numerous little open-air restaurants or if the family party have brought their own provisions sitting at ease on the ground after lunch every one flocks back to the town carrying their grilli with them to be taken home or given as a present to some favoured friend no matter where its destination may be the subsequent movements of the grilla are watched with intense interest for in etruscan and grecian times the little creature was regarded as a type of human life and certain superstitions linger round it even to the present day if it chirps loudly as it is carried over the threshold of its new abode good luck will pursue the inhabitants during the coming year if it lives and thrives in captivity which it very rarely does their lives will be long and vice versa it is considered a portent of great happiness if a grilla caught on ascension day survives till corpus christi another children's festa which however is dying out is the fiera colne or feast of the lanterns which falls on the seventh of september at this festa the children in the poorer parts of the city run about after dark with little lanterns made of coloured paper stretched on canes and fashioned to represent some familiar object such as a boat a globe a fish or a bell the last feast of the ecclesiastical year is the feast of all saints which on the morrow merges into that of all souls all saints is a great festival all the shops are shut all the bells rung and every one turns out in their best attire to do honour to their dead after mass which takes place very early in the morning all the inhabitants of the city men women and little children throng across the bridges and up the narrow pathway known as the via crucis which leads through the olives to the church and churchyard of san miniato which is the great necropolis of florence every one carries flowers in one form or another from the most elaborate wreaths and crosses to the simple poses held in baby hands for the roman church has never relinquished the ancient belief in the communion of saints therefore to her children the day of the dead is no gloomy commemoration but a joyous festival when heaven and earth come very near together and living and departed rejoice in one common hope so the graves must be wreathed in flowers and candles lit upon them which glimmer pale and shadowy in the sunlight but which glow brighter and brighter as daylight declines and shine out with steady light when the short day has ended and darkness has fallen End of chapter 7chapter eight of things seen in florence by elizabeth grierson 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Environments Next in interest to the city of Florence itself is the little sister city of Fiesole, standing on its hill about two miles to the northward. The appellation city sits strangely upon it, for splendid as it may have been in olden times, it is a mere village today, although it still possesses a cathedral and a bishop of its own. One can reach it by tramcar from the Duomo or by hired carriage, but either of these methods entails a long dusty drive, as the public road winds in rather a tedious manner up the hillside, and it is much more direct, and also a hundred times more interesting, to climb to Fiesole on foot, through the narrow lanes and up the steep rocky paths, which have been trodden before us by bishops and monks, and fierce Medici warriors, whose names stand out among those of the makers of Florence. We can, if we will, take the tram from the Duomo to the Porta San Gallo, then, alighting, take the second road to the right, and follow the course of the Mugnone until we come to the walls which surround the garden of the Villa Palmieri. It was within these walls that Boccaccio's seven maidens, with their swains, took refuge during a visitation of plague in 1348, and spent their time telling stories and listening to the songs of the nightingales. It was here also that Queen Victoria, of pious memory, spent some happy weeks in the spring of 1888. After passing the walls of this villa, we reached the convent of San Domenico di Fiesole, where Guido da Vicchio, better known as Fra Angelico, and his brother Benedetto, who afterwards became Pope of Rome, served their novitiates and became Dominican friars. The church has been despoiled, but two frescoes of Fra Angelico's still remain, a triptych, a Madonna and Saints, in the choir, and a crucifixion in the sacristy. If we will, we can branch off the road here, and visit the Badia de Fiesole, which we see marked out by its campanile on the left. Both convent and church are very beautiful, and the place is haunted by memories of Bishop Romolo, the first bishop of Fiesole, who is said to have been sent here in A.D. 60 by the Apostle Peter himself, also of two Irish saints, Donato and Andrew, who set out in the ninth century to make a pilgrimage to Italy, to visit the holy places, and were so charmed with the beauty of this hill that they entered the convent and spent the remainder of their lives here. From the Dominican monastery the path ascends straight up the slope, growing ever steeper and steeper, but we hardly notice the difficulty of the way as we feast our eyes on the wonderful panorama spread out beneath us, ever growing wider and more far-reaching the higher we ascend or gaze at the extraordinary wealth of colouring which meets us at every turn, for the hill of Fiesole, especially in springtime, is a veritable paradise of flowers. Indeed, no one who has wandered along its byways at this season, and passed through fields ablaze with tulips and anemones, narcissi and irises, violets and periwinkles, while overhead almond and peach and apricot blossom in all the loveliness of their delicate tints stand out against the sky can doubt as to where fra angelico learned to choose the colours for the robes of his heavenly hosts higher up still we pass the villa medici hidden in gardens and shut in by ancient cypresses and the convent of san girolamo reached by a flight of moss-grown stone steps which are also guarded by cypresses this convent is now occupied by Irish nuns, the little company of Mary. These sisters are more commonly known as the blue nuns, from the blue veils which form part of their dress. They are a nursing order, and besides taking cases in Florence and elsewhere, they receive convalescent patients into the convent. A little farther on we reach the piazza round which the village of Fiesole centres. It is somewhat dusty and windswept, and as it serves both as a car terminus and a cab stand, we are at once beset by cabmen who wish to drive us back to Florence, by boys who flourish postcards in our faces, and by little girls who offer us sweet-smelling poses with the most enticing of smiles. There are also plenty of loitering beggars who press forward with eager requests to be allowed to guide us to the Roman theatre. 
we will be wise if we shake off all those importunate folk with the exception perhaps of the little flower girls for the postcards are poor and we can explore fiesole to better advantage alone the piazza occupies what was probably the site of the etruscan forum facing us as we stand with our backs to the path up which we have climbed is the cathedral to the left is a franciscan monastery and the little church of san alessandro standing where in etruscan days stood a temple dedicated to bacchus or the etruscan equivalent to bacchus behind us down a narrow lane are some very well preserved remains of a roman theatre and baths and the fragments of a temple these ruins lie basking in the sun on the slope of the hill on the other side from florence and little active green lizards creep out and in among the old stones traces of the ancient etruscan wall can also be seen here showing how these old builders did their work simply placing one enormous block of stone on top of another the cathedral is interesting as being the burial place of san donatos and containing the tomb of bishop salutati which is considered the masterpiece of the sculpture mino da fiesole but it is not in the cathedral that one feels inclined to linger but up on the crest of the hill which rises to the west of the piazza which is reached by a steep narrow lane haunted by beggars and starving uncared for dogs at the top of this lane there is a little plateau which boasts a couple of seats and is protected by a low stone wall from this point of vantage the most wonderful view is obtained beneath us to the left lies florence with her domes and spires seen through a delicate tracery of fruit trees opposite is san miniato that hill of gardens up which the inhabitants of the city are carried when the time comes for them to sleep their long sleep to the south and west wind the valleys of the arno and mugnone the former bounded in the distance by range after range of hills clinging to the sides of which tiny little white walled chittas are to be seen while against the far horizon rise the peaks of the apennines and the mountains behind which lie the valley of the tiber and rome if we would catch some glimpses of real tuscan peasant life we have only to dip over the crest of the hill and turn our faces in the direction of the outlying villages of settignano and maianno if we do so we will find plenty to interest us in watching the swarthy contadini tilling their little plots of ground or ploughing between the rows of vines or olives with their teams of patient oxen in the goat herds tending their goats and in the bright-eyed dark-haired girls who take their part so readily in all kinds of outside work no one who visits the country round about florence in early summer can fail to be struck by the large stretches of ground covered with irises which are grown in the vicinity in large numbers wrapping parts of the hillsides in a perfect glory of purple and mauve this stately flower besides being indigenous to the soil is specially cultivated by farmers and peasant proprietors not only for the sale of its blossoms but in order that its roots may be sold to form the principal ingredients of the fragrant orris root perfumes for which the city is famous these perfumes are manufactured and sold in the ancient farmacia of santa maria novella the peasants attend to their little crops of irises in their spare time the girls rising early in the bright summer mornings to cut the blossoms before the strength of the sun has withered them and carry them down to the city in sheaves to sell them at street corners or in the mercato nuovo afterwards when the roots come to be lifted they are peeled and dried at odd moments but on a large podere or farm the digging of the iris roots is like any other harvest a time when every one is busy and when outside help is wanted it takes place in july when the flowering season is over then the plants are dug up and the largest roots laid aside for peeling while the small tubers which have been thrown out are cut off and replanted to grow into mature roots in two years time every morning a quantity of roots are dug up in this way and carried to the farm buildings to be weighed they are then handed over to bands of women and girls who have been engaged for the purpose 
and who settle themselves in some outhouse or in some shady spot in the open air and peel and chatter and chatter and peel all through the livelong day in the evening the peeled roots are spread out on stoyer or mats and carried to some safe place and then they are left until they have shrivelled up and are hard as wood then they are taken to the city where in the different manufactories they are ground to powder which finds its way as florence or its root to shops all over the world it is august before the ingathering of the iris crop is over in september comes the vendemiare or vintage this is a time of great rejoicing and constant picnicking for the grapes are gathered on different estates on different days so that all the neighbours may have their due share in the festivities first at one podere then at another invitations to take part in the vendemiare having been sent out by the fattore or bailiff the recipients flock to the vineyard in the early morning men and women and children for even tiny fingers can help to gather grapes every one carries a basket made of pleated osiers and the older folk have provided themselves with sharp knives vines in tuscany are as a rule allowed to grow very luxuriantly being trained in loose festoons over mulberry trees which are planted for the purpose in regular rows up and down the hillsides soon every one is busy the grown-ups cutting the luscious bunches from the vines the children picking up the unblemished grapes which have fallen on the ground eating as many as they can meanwhile when the baskets are filled they are emptied into wooden casks which have been placed at intervals in the field and these in their turn are placed on wagons which are drawn by docile oxen to the aya or great stone shed where the wine vats are to be found the grapes are passed through a machine which slices them down then the juicy mass is thrown into a vat and in the evening when work in the fields is finished stalwart contadini come bare to the knees and tread the grapes singing lustily in chorus meanwhile fermentation and other processes follow and when the wine is ready for use it is sold in casks or in the quaint long-necked straw-covered flasks which we have seen brought to the city in such large quantities when as often happens on large estates the vendemiari lasts for several days a supper is given on the last evening by the padrone or master to all who have taken part gentle and simple alike for family friends as well as humbler neighbours make a point of lending their aid after the supper is ended dancing is carried on merrily by moonlight or starlight in the open air the olive crop is of as much or even more importance than the vintage for italy makes a great boast of her olive oil which is perhaps the purest in the world the olive trees are not left to grow in wild luxuriance like the vines but are carefully pruned and cut back in the spring then they are left to themselves all summer while the husbandman ploughs the strips of red earth that run between their ordered ranks and sows and reaps his crop of maize or millet or melons in the late autumn he begins to take more heed to the olives which by then are beginning to change colour or rather he takes anxious heed to the weather for if a storm should arise and the fruit be battered about or blown to the ground a great part of his profit would be gone as the best quality of oil cannot be obtained from bruised and damaged olives the picking of the fruit which begins at the end of november and goes on all through december entails a great amount of labour as each olive is taken separately from its branch by men and women who stand on ladders to do so the fruit is carried to the frantoio or oil pressing room where it is thrown into an enormous stone basin and crushed kernels and all by a wheel which is attached to a pole projecting from a pillar in the centre and is worked by a docile ox which plods patiently round and round outside the basin on a track of dried leaves and ferns when the olives have been sufficiently bruised the oily pulp is lifted out with wooden shovels and put into a wine press which on small farms at least is worked by the peasants themselves who form a very picturesque picture as in their scanty garments and bright coloured sashes they throw all their weight on the beam of wood by which the screw is turned 
the finest quality of oil is that which trickles out first and it seems as if there were some truth in the assertion that the italians keep this to themselves for it is certainly not like that we buy in england being practically colourless and absolutely tasteless in former years a very fitting custom obtained in the neighbourhood of florence two small barrels of oil were entrusted to the care of the representatives of some special church or brotherhood it might be the franciscans of fiesole this year the brothers of san miniato next in order that they might be offered as a thanks offering for the olive harvest at the altar of the church of the santissima annunziata the brethren who chanced to have the honour to be elected conveyed the barrels to the church slung on either side of a mule which was ridden by a tiny boy dressed as an angel a similar custom prevails to-day at the village of signa which is situated some seven miles from florence where on easter monday the festival of the local saint is held the saint being a little shepherdess beata giovanna who in the thirteenth century left her sheep to follow a life of stricter devotion in a tiny cell on the hillside on her festival all the daughter churches which are dependent on the parish church of signa send an offering of oil to supply the lamps of the blessed giovanna's shrine and each offering is brought by a tiny boy or girl angel who heads his or her village procession seated on a donkey each procession is met at the door of the church by the parish priest of signa and the proud little angel is allowed to ride up the central aisle to the altar where it deposits its offering afterwards retiring by a side aisle thus making room for the next comer about two and a half miles from florence overlooking the valdemma stands the picturesque carthusian monastery now rapidly approaching dissolution which is generally spoken of simply as the certosa we reach it by the road which passes through the porte romana and leads to the little village of san galuzzo where the entire female population seems engaged in autumn at least in plaiting straw from this tiny hamlet the road winds through pleasant undulating country thickly studded with cottages farmhouses and villages and one is tempted to linger by the wayside and watch the peasants who are always busy in their plots of ground hoeing the soil pruning the trees cutting their little patches of hay or wheat ploughing their tiny vineyards or watering them by hand with water which we can watch being drawn in bucketfuls from a moss-grown well by a docile mild-eyed ox the certosa which stands like a massive fortress on top of the hill montaguto is reached by a steep narrow lane bordered by low walls on which drowsy green lizards lie basking in the sun the gate is opened by an ancient rosy-cheeked porter monk clad all in white with smooth shaved head and a beard which matches his habit another brother a facsimile of the first shows us over the monastery which is a veritable habitation of peace with its clusters of cells built round a square cloister now used as a garden orchard and burial ground in early summer this garden is a dream of fragrance and beauty being full of sweet-smelling herbs and flowers for the ancient brethren of the certosa support themselves by the sale of home-made liqueur perfumes tonics and febrifuges so the flower-beds which are laid out round the quaint canopied well in the centre of the cloister are fragrant with lavender roses carnations verbenas jasmines oranges lemons thyme sage and all manner of aromatic herbs the certosa was built in the fourteenth century with a view to educating students for the priesthood to form a college in fact but this design was never carried out and now it is the house of a handful of aged weather-beaten cheerful gardener monks who live under a strict rule of silence and only eat together on sundays and holy days their numbers are gradually diminishing however as one after another is laid to rest among the flowers and the bees in the garden cloister no fresh inmates are admitted so when the last brother is carried out and the last grave filled up the ancient order of things will have passed away and the old monastery will be turned to other uses end of chapter eight end of things seen in florence by elizabeth grierson read by phil benson 
in Sydney, Australia.